There are few instances when a piece of media comes out that is so good that it changes your entire expectations from the field as a whole. Jujutsu Kaisen Season 2 Episode 5 is one such piece of media. I'm never going to be able to look at shonen anime the same way again. If you're new to my channel, one look at my previous videos and you'll be able to tell easily that I usually focus on the animation side and the production side of an anime because there are already a lot of big anime channels that focus on the storytelling, characters and the writing side of things. But this episode was so good that I can't help myself. I'm going to be dedicating two whole videos about it. The first one is this one and the second one obviously an animation analysis because even from a visual point of view, this episode is an absolute masterpiece and one of, if not the best Jujutsu Kaisen episode in that front as well. This episode is one of the best anime episodes to come out this year. And the only reason, the only reason I'm saying one of the best and not the best episode of anime that came this year is just because Peak Fiction also aired this year, episode 9 of which is still my episode of the year. On an unrelated note though, I just want to think just how incredible Studio Mappa is from the average consumer's perspective. And again, I'm not even just talking about from an animation point of view, just from the stories that's being told at Studio Mappa. The only thing that can even compete with the masterpiece that is the latest Jujutsu Kaisen episode is Vinland Saga and the Attack on Titan special, both of which were also produced at Mappa. Sometimes you just gotta give it to Manabo Otsuka. Anyway, let's get into the episode again. This episode is a masterpiece on every single level that you could think of, whether it's the writing, the voice acting, the direction, the music, or the animation. I'm going to be focusing more on the writing and the direction element for this video because I'm going to be making an animation analysis anyway. From a storytelling point, there are multiple factors that Gege kept in mind for this arc, but I would say the main core component is the dichotomy between the two main characters, that is Gojo and Geto. There are two characters who are very similar, but also fundamentally different in every conceivable way. And that is represented visually, like their character designs, they are pretty much polar opposites from their hair color to their outfits, to their body language, but it's also represented at like a metaphoric level, like literally their names, Gojo, Geto, Satoru, Suguru. Similar names that are also just fundamentally different. And writing up the villain, that is Geto Suguru from the ground up, while also through the same story, building up the hero that is Gojo Satoru. Akutami Gege is a genius to do that in the span of such a short arc nevertheless. To talk about the genius writing and direction of this episode though, I have to start with the ending of the previous episode, that is episode 4, because the ending of that episode, the final portion is really set up for episode 5 I would say. Jujutsu Kaisen episode 4 ends with Toji's death. And on death, Toji lets Gojo know about Megumi. Megumi has already metaphorically been referred to as blessing by Toji. And the literal word meaning of Megumi is also a blessing. So upon death, Toji Fushiguro is leaving Gojo his blessing. Literally, because he is leaving Megumi to Gojo. But also figuratively, because this event is what made Gojo who he is today. But on the other side, upon death, Toji left his curse for Ghetto. This is the event that kickstarted Ghetto's downward spiral towards madness. Finally, let's talk about the clapping sequence. Sounds kind of a sexual out of context. I have separated the clap sequences into four different phases. I term these four together, the clap cycle. So this is the first phase, very well shown by the animation expression. You can just see the horror that's animated in Ghetto's face here. Just how much this entire scenario traumatized him. Just a bunch of people clapping and celebrating a little girl's death. This is another instance that goes to show the dichotomy of these characters. Gojo talks about killing all of these people. Not because he hates them or anything, he's indifferent towards them. He just feels like these people who are celebrating the death of a little girl, they need to die. And when Geto says no, Gojo is fine with it. He literally does not even blink an eye to it. Geto, on the other hand, he really wants to kill these people. His anger and indecisiveness is shown by animation in the way his pupils are moving here. You see how his pupils are just continuously moving back and forth. The only reason he does not kill these people is because he's desperately clinging on to his ideals as a Jujutsu sorcerer. Entirely different from Gojo's perspective. Geto is desperately clinging on to righteousness but he's on the darkest side of it. And in the end, Arifumi Mai has cleverly structured this in a way that it literally shows Gero sinking to darkness. All of that neatly carries forward to the next episode. Here they're showing Geto's and Gojo's dichotomy using three things. Visual metaphors, short composition, and spacing. As for the short composition, you immediately see it. Geto is placed completely in the shadows. Next shot, it's even more apparent. Geto is literally in frame, but your eyes actually naturally move to Gojo because he's in the bright side. As for the visual metaphors, they're pretty damn obvious and kind of on the nose. Gojo's side 
a well-lit tunnel that ends to the path of brightness. And now we get to Ghetto Side, a dark and depressing tunnel that has no light in it. The visual metaphors are great, and the short composition with the shadows are also great, but it's not anything I've never seen before. It's just high-level brilliance. What really elevates this to masterpiece status is just the fact that Shota Gojizono is storyboarding this, and that's the third point, spacing. The way he shows the growing distance between Ghetto and Gojo is spectacular. We are in phase two of the clap cycle now. Phase one was a traumatic event. Phase two is PTSD. You can see how this image of the clapping is drawn here. It's not a proper image. It's like an image in between motion. As if this instance is literally photographed into Ghetto's memory. And on the audio side of things, for phase one, we had the actual audio of the clap. For phase two, we got the audio of the shower droplets slowly transitioning into clapping. This is not me being constipated. This is me resisting the urge to go on a three hour long tangent about Taki and Inuma's corrections. I'll talk about this in the animation analysis. Now we get to Geto's conversation with the guy who I predicted was gonna die from his very first appearance and the lady who is my brother's sensei. About what she talks about Toji here. So if I'm not mistaken, Toji is even a more special case compared to Maki. For Maki, it just took her to like a regular old human level. So she couldn't see curses without the glasses. But when put into like a life or death situation, she can see the curse. But in Toji's case, even when put in a life or death situation, he probably can't see the curses. But he can sense them because of the separation that's caused between him and cursed energy as he has literally zero cursed energy. With the exit sign, there are two different types of metaphors here. One is Geto taking his easy way out that I'll explain later, the two methods that comes into play. Two methods of preventing tragedy from happening again, like what happened with Riko-chan. Because even in the case of Riko-chan, the exit sign was used as a metaphor. In episode 3, after the beautiful aquarium sequence, you see the exit sign flickering, which is, you know, foreshadowing to what's gonna happen to Riko. Here, Gero is talking about killing all non-sorcerers and how that will, you know, eliminate the need of having Jujutsu sorcerers in the first place. If everyone is a Jujutsu Sorcerer, no one is a Jujutsu Sorcerer. And when the special grade lady calls out his name, you see his change in expression. It's a mix of surprise and fear. Surprise because he just leaked his true feelings, and fear because that's a special grade lady sitting next to him. So he does fear that she's gonna admonish him because of what he just said. You know, Hanji Zoe's famous words, genocide is wrong. But then she says that, yeah, that's a good possibility. And Geto's worried expression goes back to surprise because of a completely different reason. This lady is like both the angel and devil on Geto's shoulders. Now we get to phase three of the clapping that is overcoming the PTSD. The clapping comes in the background again when we get into Geto's mindset. When she lets him know that neither one is how you truly feel, the clapping goes back into just being the sound of rain. Now that he's found a way out, a way by which he does not have to keep carrying on with this pain. And now we get to the earlier exit sign metaphor that I'm talking about. This part of you despising non-sorcerers pointing towards the exit. That is Ghetto's way out of being a Jujutsu sorcerer. The other one points into, you know, Jujutsu High's hallway. Rejecting his evil desires, carrying out his duty as a Jujutsu sorcerer. And a ray of sunshine pops into Ghetto's world. And finally, coming to know that Tengen is still stable because there are other star platinum missiles as well. The lady is trying to be nice to him, but all it really does is rub salt to the injury. Haibara's death just makes everything worse. He sees Haibara's death as blood in his hands. Not because he killed Haibara, but because he's refusing to kill all the people who are not Jujutsu sorcerers. Which, ironically enough, would actually put even more blood in his hands. But that again goes to show just how twisted his ideologies have gotten. This is my favorite sequence of the episode, because unlike the first sequence of this episode that used on-the-nose visual metaphors, it takes a completely different level of genius to construct visual metaphors by physical ideas that make sense. An example would be the sequences with the tomato in Heavenly Delusion episode 12. What is happening to the tomato physically makes sense, but it stands for something entirely different. That is exactly what is happening here. The two sides of Ghetto, Jujutsu Sorcerer Ghetto and the part of him that despises non-Jujutsu Sorcerers are shown by the shadows. One of them is a little bit more faded than the other one. The two shadows are not randomly thrown in there. There are two shadows because there are two sources of light. One candle that is standing strong and the one that is just barely lit up is his Jujutsu Sorcerer side. And finally, this incident with the two girls pushes him over the edge. The candle that represents Jujutsu Sorcerer Ghetto goes out. Only one true ghetto remains now. Apart from that, the framing is also brilliant. These two girls are thrown in like a prison kind of space, but their faces are perfectly visible. Whereas the other two, you know, the ones outside the prison, their faces are completely blocked off. By the very bars, they're using to imprison the children. You have not trapped the little girls in prison. You are trapped in the real prison 
with Geto Sukuru. Then it's just a masterclass of Hisashi Mori's incredible animation. I um, have to talk about this in the animation analysis. The Uzumaki pin on his uniform finally falls to the ground. Geto Suguru is no longer a Jujutsu sorcerer. The voice acting in this entire scenario is just absolutely incredible. Gojo's voice actor crushes it every time. His voice acting for Crazy Gojo in the previous episode is just absolutely perfect because he's also voicing my favorite character in Blue Lock. And that guy's got some absolutely crazy lines coming up soon in Blue Lock. And I can't wait to see the anime to adapt that in still frames. Also, I love just how chill Shoko is. I don't really know what she's actually looking for here because even after Ghetto comes, she's not really lit the cigarette. She's still not smoking. She's just putting the cigarette into her mouth. Again, just love how chill she is with when Gojo tells her, I'm assuming, to catch Suguru. I'm not gonna fucking do that. He's a special grade sorcerer. He's gonna fucking kill me. Extraordinary framing work again. Remember how in the beginning the distance between them was exaggerated by using complex perspectives in terms of spacing? Now their gap is being bridged multiple times by using vehicles as transitions. And Gojo just has no reply to what Geto is saying. He prepares to attack him with this specific hand sign, but he's unable to carry forth because of his kindness. This is Geto taking his new persona here, and you start off with a spider web. Of course, classic. The incredible animation with his performance and all of that is great, but what I want you to pay attention to is the score. The score did not come out of nowhere either. If you go to the previous scene, you can see that this is the last and final phase of the clap cycle. It's already established that the people who are clapping here, they are the same people who clapped for Amanai's death. And their clapping fades out and transitions into Ghetto's theme. Massive praises to Atsushi Nakagawa, who is the episode director. Though all of this is being storyboarded by Shota Kuchizono, Nakagawa as episode director is the one who's processing Goso's storyboards as the audiovisual masterpiece that you're seeing on screen right now. I also absolutely love this cut in. Many objected. <laughs> they don't even need to show them objecting because they're so irrelevant. Love the parallels between Mentor Geto and Mentor Gojo as well. The two girls with respect to this frame are still on the side of brightness whereas Ghetto is coming from the pitch black side. Now we get to the exact opposite side. Look at where the source of light is placed here. I have to say again, a masterpiece on every possible level. A very similar looking hand sign to the one that he made while he almost killed Ghetto. Gojo, unlike Ghetto, was able to come in terms with the fact that he is a kind person. I love how the bass is almost like boosted here to get the sheer seriousness in Gojo's voice across. No, 100% no. It's such a stark contrast that it scares little Megumi. And yes, finally Gojo opens his eyes and we get to see the tree and the chair that he fell asleep in. An opening is supposed to be a completely different entity compared to the episode. But this even ties into the opening itself, which is like brilliant. And yeah, that's about it. A very different kind of video to the type that I usually make. I have to say again that this does not mean that I'm going to stop making animation analysis videos. Animation is still my number one passion and the number one most important thing for me when it comes to anime. But hey, if you would also like me to make more videos like this one, let me know down in the comment section. You can also let me know by leaving a like. If you did not like this video, however, you can leave a dislike. Subscribe and share, spread the love. And yeah, that's about it. Thanks for the views.